In the last video, we talked about all sorts of things about the consumer's utility curves. This time, I want us to talk about the budget constraint and what this implies on the utility maximizing choice of a consumer. First and foremost, we know that everything the consumer consumes has a price, and the sum of everything the consumer pays for should be equal to or less than his budget. In our case, the consumer buys only two goods, so his budget, which we will denote as M, should be equal to the price of good one, which we will denote as P1, times the quantity of good one, plus the price of good two, times the quantity of good two. Since price is an exogenous variable, and we have no control over it, we only have to worry about the quantities of good one and two. Here, the consumer must choose between two goods given a budget and the prices of the goods. We want to find all possible combinations that would exhaust the budget of the consumer. Let's use this example where the budget of the consumer M is equal to 10. And the price of good 1 would be equal to 1. And the price of good 2 would be equal to 2. So this function here, let me just, this function here will now be 10 is equal to 1 times x sub 1 plus 2 times x sub 2. Immediately, we find this function to be linear, meaning we only have to find two points on the budget line and draw a straight line from that point to the other point to find the budget line. So the easiest way to do this is to find the maximum quantity of good 1 that the consumer can buy if he does not consume any quantities of good 2. So we set x sub 2 to be equal to 0, and what we find is that 10 would now be equal to x sub 1, meaning on the budget line, when the consumer does not consume good 2 and only consumes good 1, he would consume 10 units of good 1. On the other hand, we can repeat this process for x sub 2, and what we find is 10, let me use another color, 10 would now be equal to 2 x sub 2. And so x sub 2 would be equal to 5. And this is the maximum quantity of good 2 that the consumer can buy. And when we graph this, when we graph this on our indifference map, let me just draw that down here. When we draw that on our indifference map, we'll actually see this is x sub 1. We'll actually see that this is the point where the consumer consumes only x sub 1, in which he uses all of his budget. So this is 10 of x sub 1. And on the y-axis, we have x sub 2. And 5 would be somewhere down here. This would be 5. And again, this function is actually linear, as we talked about a while ago. So I could just draw a line from here to here. And this is what we call our budget line. Um, the line that we see here is where the consumer actually uses up all of his budget to buy goods 1 and good 2. The area below the budget line, however, are all possible combinations of x sub 1 and x sub 2 that the consumer can buy without using up his budget. So I'll just shade this area over here just to show, illustrate. And so this is the area where the consumer buys bundles of x sub 1 and x sub 2, but does not use up his budget. However, as we've discussed in the previous video, we assume that the consumer is utility maximizing. This means that he would deplete his budget to get the greatest utility. To deplete his budget, he has to buy the bundles of good 1 and good 2 that are on the budget line not below because that would not deplete his budget and not above because he can't afford it. This is one of the first order conditions for utility maximization. Now I want to introduce three utility levels on the graph. So this one, this utility curve, this utility curve, and this utility curve. So I'll label them accordingly. This would be U1. This would be u2, and this would be u3. These utility curves represent levels of utility from the utility function of the consumer. And again, 
There are infinite levels of utility in this indifference map, but we are only showing three to simplify things and to prove a point. Now that we have three utility levels on our uh, indifference map and a budget line, how much of good one and good two will the consumer buy to maximize his utility? We can see that the consumer would always prefer to be on a higher utility level, so U3 would be the most straightforward answer. However, the consumer cannot afford to buy quantities of good 1 and good 2 that could bring him to the utility level of good th utility level 3. Utility level 1 is also a choice, but it's not the utility maximizing choice since the consumer can get on a higher indifference curve. So the answer should be obvious if you've taken up introductory microeconomics, but the answer is that the consumer would consume the combinations where the combination where U2 and the budget line just touch. We say that utility is maximized when the indifference curve is tangent to the budget line. Why? Because this is the highest utility level that the consumer can afford. But how do we show this mathematically? We know that at this point, right here where U2 touches the budget line, we know that at this point, the slope of the budget line is equal to the slope of the indifference curve. But what is the slope of the budget line? In our graph here, it's the change in x sub 2, the change, let me change that color, it's the change in x sub 2 with respect to a change in x sub 1, x sub 1, not 2. And we can find this by simply manipulating our budget. Simply, let me just rewrite the budget constraint here. M is equal to P1X1 plus P2X2. And so here we want to actually find X sub 2. So we divide both sides with P2. So 1 over P sub 2. And so what we get is M over P2 should be equal to X sub 1, P1 over P2 plus x sub 2. And by isolating x sub 2, let me just rewrite this guy here. So by isolating x sub 2, we actually find that x sub 2 is equal to m over p2 minus x sub 1 times p1 over p2. And so we actually see that as x sub 1 changes, x sub 2 changes by p1 over p2 or negative p1 over p2 and so this is the slope of our budget line negative it's negative p1 over p2 negative p1 over p2 is equal to the slope of our budget line budget and m over p2 is simply the um, intercept of x sub 2, which we can see on our graph. m, which is 10, over 2, which is the price of 2 a while ago, would be equal to 5. And we see here, we see here that it is indeed equal to 5. And so now that we have found the slope of our budget line, we can now look for the slope of our um, indifference curve. And from what we tackled in the previous video, the slope of our IC, slope of IC, is just equal to the negative of our marginal rate of substitution. And this is just equal to negative MU1 over MU2. If you haven't encountered how to look for the marginal rate of substitution, I suggest looking first at the previous previous video that I've uploaded. So again, the condition for utility maximization requires that the slope of the indifference, indifference curve would be equal to the slope of the budget line. And so we just have to equate the two. So the slope of the IC, which is negative MU1 over MU2 should be equal to the slope of the budget line, which is negative P1 over P2. And by manipulating this or simply cross-multiplying this, we can actually find that MU1 
over P1 should be equal to MU2 over P2. There is intuition behind the MU1 over P1 is equal to MU2 over P2, but we won't discuss this here in this video. Um, so anyway, going back, um, MU1 over P1 is equal to MU2 over P2 is our second first order condition for utility maximization. Another way to solve this is actually to use the Lagrangian method, although we won't show this anymore, but feel free to try it out yourself if you're up to a little challenge. Just know that when you maximize utility subject to the budget constraint, uh, I'll just write that down. So when you maximize, maximize your utility, x sub 1, x sub 2, subject to st, which stands for subject to, the budget constraint, which is m, is equal to p1, x1, plus p2, x2, you should get the same results. By the way, and this has to be given emphasis, we are only finished here if we already know that the indifference curve is strictly convex. The strict convexity of the indifference curve is the second order condition, or the SOC. In other words, we have to check if the marginal rate of substitution is diminishing. Why? Because if the indifference curve is not strictly convex, the point of tangency may actually be a minimum. And I'll just try to show this here on the right. And so I'll just draw a graph again. And this graph is our um, indifference map. So x sub 1, x sub 2. And so we have a budget line. And typically, we would think of utility curves as convex, strictly convex. And this is what we mean by strictly convex. But what if our indifference curve actually looks something like this? And so now, instead of finding the maximum, we actually found the minimum. And so it's important, again, to check if the marginal rate of substitution is diminishing. So in summary, to find the utility maximizing quantities of good 1 and good 2, subject to a budget constraint, I'm just dictating what I wrote here, maximizing utility subject to a budget constraint, we have to make sure that the first order conditions, or FOCs, first order conditions, have to be satisfied. And the first order condition is that the consumer, let me just write one there, okay, the consumer has to use up his budget. So thus the equal sign there and not the less than sign has to use up his budget on goods one and good two because we are on a two goods case. If this was um, I number of goods, then this would be um, all of those goods. M should be equal to the summation of PI XI and two, the negative of the slope of the budget line should be equal to the negative of the slope of the budget line should be equal to the marginal rate of substitution so p1 over p2 which is the negative of the slope of the budget line should be equal to our marginal rate of substitution which is mu1 over mu2 and again, if we are not sure that the indifference curve of the consumer is strictly convex, then we have the second order condition, or SOC, where we find that D, a partial, the partial derivative of your marginal rate of substitution with respect to good 1 is actually less than 0. Or... In other words, your marginal rate of substitution should be diminishing. These conditions must be used, however, with caution, because special utility functions such as perfect complements and perfect substitutes do not follow or do not need the first order conditions and second order conditions, but still have unique bundles that maximize utility.